He existed before nothing existed. He exists and he shall exist when, not, when everything ceases to exist. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot conceive the dimension of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it means when we say he is everlasting, he is eternal, he is all powerful in his dominion. And so to recognize Allah and to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to go back to the Quran. For example, a simple reading of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give you, would broaden the horizon of the believer as to what Allah is. Every single name, stop there and try to understand what it means. And that gives you quite a, a broad perspective on, on who he is, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other one that I want to discuss is the oneness of the Lordship. He is the divine. He is the only one in his divinity, which means in his dominion. There is no partner to him in his dominion. That dominion that I spoke about, the microscopic as well as the microscopic words, the universe behind us, that we, be beyond us, that we do not know about. That is the dominion of Allah. Now, that is what exists. Now, what happens after everything ceases to exist? That's another dimension of his dominion. Because when all of, when all of us die, we spoke about the pillar of faith, which is the belief in the hereafter, the day of judgment. That's a different life, which is much more extensive than today's life. In fact, Allah says that uh, uh, one day by the sight of your Lord is like the thousand years by your own counting. So if we count, count here 1,000 years, it's one day in that other life. So that dominion is his. We don't even know much about it. So that's what it means, the divinity and the dominion of Allah. It's everything that he, that is under his control. So that's the oneness of the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the uh, oneness of lordship. And then there is the oneness of worship. With all this power and what we owe to him, he is the only one deserving to be worshipped. No one is deserving to be worshipped. And anyone who claims to be deserving to be worshipped has trespassed his or her line. Because it is only him that deserves to be worshipped and no prophet has taught otherwise. Every prophet has recognized the dominion of Allah, the Creator, and the rights of Allah on humanity to worship him and him alone, without partners. This is extremely important. And so, when we stand up in prayer, we pray to him. But also, what does it mean? It means that we need to empty our heads and minds of everything that we worry about when we stand up in prayer, and this is the challenge of the believer. Because if not, then who, who am I worshipping? Am I standing physically in front of the, the one to be worshipped, and yet my mind is busy with the little things of life? This is the challenge. We have to empty. Because remember, what do we say when we stand up in prayer? What do we say first? We say, right? We raise our hands and we say, Allahu Akbar. We declare that greatness of the Lord that we are about to start worshipping. And so if he is the greater, how come these little things get in? They should not get in and we should fight them out that they don't get in. Uh, also, an important aspect is the equality of his creation. Now he is the creator and everything else is created. And especially amongst human, no one has the right to declare that he is superior over the other because we are all his creation. We are all his servants. No one has the right to claim to be superior than the other, whether in lineage, in color, in descent, geographical location, doesn't matter. 
We are all his creation. And if humanity understood this, it would have a tremendous impact and it would solve a lot of problems that we are living in. If this, only this, would have been recognized, then we should feel all like we are God's creation. We are here to serve his will. We are here to live according to his guidance. And therefore, there is no reason why should we enslave one another or should we transgress against one another or should we treat another one unjustly. There is no room for this. It should not be. And so this is the power of the message of Islam. Uh, I have quoted here one hadith uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned uh, regarding this aspect, and for the sake of time, you have it in writing. Uh, now, very quickly, what is the impact of this uh, concept of Tawheed on human behavior? Number, there are a few things that uh, uh, I just want to mention. Number one, it comes to this, that we are created on this earth to live according to the will and the orders and the guidance of our Creator. Therefore, we shall not, we as Muslims, shall not accept to abuse his creation. Right? Abuse his creation, whether abusing of the human being living near me or under my authority, or abusing the environment in which I am living in, be it uh, wasting water or polluting that water or polluting that air or uh, mismanaging of the earth, all of that we are responsible for. There is no escape. It is a trust that Allah has given to us as a creator for his creation to use wisely and live in harmony with it. We shall not abuse it. We shall not waste it. And if we do that, we are responsible before Allah. So this is one first implication as individuals, communities, and societies, and humanity at large. This is an important aspect of the belief of Islam. The second is that since we are his servants, we are servants of Allah, we worship him and turn to him and fear him. Everybody else is equal to us. Therefore, for a Muslim, the fear is the fear of Allah. It's not the fear of the individual. Every other human has no more power, the true power, than anyone else. And so, when we stand up uh, to, to say the word of truth or the word of justice, speak up that word of truth, we should not be afraid of anyone except of Allah. And if this was articulated and, uh, and uh, used, then the world would also be different because nobody could fear persecution and therefore not speak. Because it's, we know that life and death is from Allah. The one who is to intimidate, really has no power except what Allah has decreed. Therefore, why fear? And this is why Islam has thrived in history and has done wonders what it did because of this concept. Uh, Muslims were fearless for the truth, not fearless to devastate things. They were fearless for the truth, to establish the truth. And in fact, leaders you know, were so, uh, so correct and so uh, uh, sharp about this that he used to implement it on, on the most powerful. In fact, Abu Bakr, the, the first Khalifa of Islam, he said, the, most, the weakest amongst you in my eye is the one that you see the most powerful amongst you until I take justice away from him for another one who was abused. So that is the standing of Islam. 